Good morning and welcome to Rudy's Electronics Lab. And in today's episode, I'm going to look at the Roden and Swart CMU 200 as a audio meter. Now, I already made a number of different episodes about the CMU device, which was originally designed as a telecommunications tester, as a generic type of instrument. And today I'm going to try to look at how it performs as an audio analyzer, because it actually has some quite capable possibilities in this, um, in this field. And eventually I'm going to look at all the different audio measurement modes and trying to answer the question, is it worthwhile using this device for this type of applications or, or not? Now, in order to do so, first I want to discuss three rather different type of measurement modes that the device had. And basically we'll start with the basic AF mode or standalone mode or whatever you want to call it. And this is the simplest mode where the CMU is sending out the type of, 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 of test signal, an audio signal. It goes to a device on the test, like an audio amplifier or a mixer or whatever, all the type of device, etc. It returns the audio signal to the CMU using the connection that we got right here on the, uh, on the front and it's being analyzed. Everything here happens in the simple audio domain here. Now, the second mode of measurements here is basically what I would call the RX measurements, which are the receiver measurements. And here actually the CMU works as an audio generator as well as a transmitter. It creates a modulated signal, an FM signal, and the device on the test will be a receiver. A regular radio receiver, FM receiver, it could be a CB device, it could be whatever. Then the audio signal is being returned to the CMU and is being analyzed. So we're doing receiver testing. And actually there is a third mode as well, which is the transmitter testing mode, in which the CMU actually sends out an audio signal to an external transmitter. That transmitter creates a radio signal, modulated FM radio signal, which is being analyzed back at the CMU. Um, and in that particular case, um, yeah, we, 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 do, we do transmission type of testing. Today I will be only looking at the first two modes and I'll pay no further attention to the, um, to the first transmitter type of, uh, of mode. But of course you can get into the CMU manual to learn a little bit more about this. Now, let's now quickly review the audio measurement functions or groups as they're called in the device uh, that I'm going to talk about in today's video. And I'm going to stick with the terminology as Roden and Swartz uses it. Might not always be the, 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 the most obvious one, I, I, I think, but the first one is simply called analyzer generator. And that is type of basic measurements you can do on a, a audio device. You're measuring uh, things like the, uh, the, the total distortion that is coming back, that is total harmonic distortion plus noise. You're measuring things like signal strength, like the, the RMS average uh, or the peak signals, and you can use a different type of bandwidth type of filters and, 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 and audio weighting uh, patterns. Uh, you, can, you can see the DC offset of your device. And how does it make such type of measurement? Well, the generator is simply going to put out one single sign tone, and whatever comes back is being measured, and we got a number of, of measurement values there. Now it gets a little bit more interesting. The second type of measurement functionality or group that is called is called multitone. And this is basically designed to evaluate the frequency response of a, of a device. And in this particular mode, the CMU is going to send out 20 tones at the same time. They can be configured in terms of, 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 of how many tones you actually use, uh, the frequency of each of these individual tones and their, their respective levels, etc. And what comes back to the device is basically shown in, in, in a graphical screen, the, the bar graph. I think I got it running on one of the two devices. I can't actually see which of the one right now, um, which gives us insight into the frequency response of the device. And finally, we got the measurement of total harmonic distortion. Um, and this is a type of measurement that, that will be just looking at the harmonic components and ignores any noise components. I'll go into that in a little bit more detail in a, in a second. So we can bit have, a, have, a, have, a, have, a, have an idea about the harmonic content or, or distortions, um, either unwanted or perhaps desired, if you want to use them in a creative way, that the device is, uh, is making. And how does it do that? In this case, it sends out a single sine tone. Um, 
but whatever is coming back is being analyzed for not only the fundamental tone, but also eight other harmonics that come above it. So the second, the third, up to the ninth harmonic. So these are the audio frequency measurements huh, that I just, uh, the, the, the audio mode that I talked about, the RF mode. Then in the radio frequency mode, we got something called, uh, a group called hum and noise measurement, which determines, as, as, as the name suggests, hum and noise um, ignoring the harmonic distortion components, etc., for RS receiver, it does so by actually turning on and off the modulated uh, tone. Um, so in this case, the device generates a modulated RF signal where there's a tone on it and comes back with measurement values. Um, and in my video, I, I think I'm not going to go too much into detail on, on this one. The one that I will be talking about, here we got also the Synet or the Synet search functionality. And this is about measuring and determining receiver sensitivity. And in the Synet mode, basically the, uh, the CMU creates again a modulated RF signal, there's a tone on it, etc. And it allows you to automatically check the Synet level which represents receiver sensitivity. Now each of these modes I will introduce in much more detail, including kind of the, the internal measurement chain, the block diagram that is used in the device uh, when I go and talk about them later in the video. So for each time I'll first talk a bit about the, the theoretical way it is being measured and then I'll show you my, 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 my measurement results and, um, and experiments. In my previous uh, slide I was already talking a little bit about different types of, of distortion. So let me say a little bit more about this uh, right now. So generally speaking, we got two types of distortions huh, differing from the, uh, the useful type of, uh, of signals that we would like to see. The one of them is, is, is harmonic distortion and the other one is noise. And it really depends on the way you implemented your measurement mode, uh, which of those you're going to pick up and what that allows you to do. So the good news is that the CMU actually allows you to investigate all these types of different things. So the analyzer generator is basically measuring the total harmonic distortions and noise components and can compare them to the useful signal. The, uh, the THD mode basically is looking at the total harmonic distortions only and will be ignoring the noise. So that's another useful type of measurement. And the hum and noise measurement actually is isolating the noise only and ignoring basically the, uh, the harmonic um, components here. Um, so the good thing is that we can measure all three different things isolated from, from each other and have different measurement modes. The bad thing is that the hum and noise is only implemented in the, in the RF uh, type of functionality here on, on the device. So it's, um, um, yeah, we might, might have wanted it in, in the regular AF type of uh, of testing here. Okay, so far about different types of distortion. Now the next thing I think we need to talk a little bit about is when do we get audio functionalities in relation to use it as a standalone type of tester and as a uh, mobile telecommunications type of, uh, of tester. And as I just indicated already a little bit on the, on the previous sheet, it's a slightly different set of things that we can measure for standalone and then for radio protocols. So in this sheet you actually get a full overview uh, standalone audio uh, with AF frequencies that is in, 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 um, in the left green bar here. And you can basically see the three measurement modes I was talking about. In the AMP thing we can do analyzer and multi-tone, um, but it's called slightly differently. It's called RX test and RX audio frequency response. Don't ask me why. If we actually go to all the other radio protocols, 2G, 3G, whatever, etc., it, it uses the same naming as in the standalone audio thing. It doesn't use in the AMPS module. And then we have the two specific hum and noise and sinus search things that are implemented in the, in the AMPS testing. Now, this is what technically is possible, where you're also going to get it depends a little bit at the hardware and software options that are installed into your device. So let's take a quick look at that now. So what will be you needing if you want to do standalone audio test? Basically you will be needing the hardware B41 interface. Um, actually you'll be needing that interface for any type of audio measurement. There is where the audio measurement hardware is, um, is on and we're going to look at that in a little bit more detail in a in a moment. You don't need any specific additional software 
options etc in, 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 um, installed. Why am I emphasizing that? I've been reading and hearing several times that the standalone audio option would only work if you have the so-called uh, K29 software option for AMPS installed on, on the device. Um, I don't know where that rumor exactly comes from. Uh, there's nothing in the R RNS manuals, I think, that suggests that. Uh, and also, actually, on the two devices I have here, one of them does not have the M thing, but as you can see here on the screens, they can both run the, uh, the standalone audio testing uh, functions. Um, so you really don't need any additional software um, if, if, if you want to just run these, uh, these modes. Then with, uh, with AMS, basically, you're going to need the, uh, the K29 option, which is basically the, uh, the, the AMS software. It doesn't require additional other hardware, except then, then the B41 audio interface. When we look at the more advanced digital radio protocols, so I'm talking about 2G GSM, 2G TDMA, also known as IS-136 or DMs, uh, 3G, various type of things, Bluetooth, in all those cases, we're going to need additional hardware as well to make that possible and additional software that supports particular frequency band for those radio standards like K21 for, for GSM and, and I noted etc here because actually you have another uh, set of, of, of software options that are for different frequency bands in, in GSM. We don't have to go here into great detail but I just want you to get an idea what type of hardware and software will be required basically uh, to do any of the things that I'm going to show to you today. Now, focusing at this um, B41 module, what, what, what is that exactly? Um, the B42 module is, um, is somewhere installed in the device, and you see two pictures of it, one from the, uh, where you see the downside connector, and one you see the, the upside, where you have the, uh, the, the smaller coaxial types of connectors. So, what is actually in this unit that can be installed in the, in the CMU? Well, we can look at the... Um, the Roden and Swartz reference manual for this device. And there we will basically learn that this is a plug-in module in HVC design. I have to admit to you, I don't know what HVC is. I've seen it only, I think, in relation to the CMU devices and, and actually also the bigger expansion boards, they're also called HVC. Um, we got eight small coaxial connectors on the top of it and that's for audio frequency, uh, which comes to the front of the device. And that's for clock frequencies and, and other stuff basically coming from other modules in the device. It is all connected with this big connector. It's a 96 pin connector to the, uh, to the motherboard, actually to motherboard 2, which is the riser motherboard that's on the side here because the audio unit is right here living on the, uh, on the side of the, of the device. And Roden and Swartz called, calls that, uh, in a nice wording, the, the future bus connector. That's the 96 pin connector that is used all the way around the device for the various options here. And what's inside the B41 module? Well, there's, there's a DSP module that, that does all the smart stuff. There's a clock generation circuit that, that basically receives the, the system clock here and generates the clock signals needed for audio measurement. And there's the analog input and output circuitry that is uh, required for that type of stuff. And, that's very kind of interesting, it also says there's a power amplifier for the, uh, for the loudspeaker. So apparently, Somewhere there is a loudspeaker. But before we get to the loudspeaker, let's see where it actually exactly sits in the device. So here in the top picture, I'm looking on the top of the device, like right from, from here on this side. And the top picture, you see the CMU without the audio module being installed. So you actually see a bunch of connectors that come from the front side, that come from the audio connectors, but they remain unconnected. They got some, some plastic shrimp around it. And once you install the audio module, it goes into that spot. And here you see that is being like all connected here. You see the red area right around it. Now, getting back to that question about the, uh, the loudspeaker. So if we go to the service manual, we would learn that the device is equipped with a loudspeaker. Um, what does it say exactly? A loudspeaker with sound outlets. The label panel allows for all that difficult language allow for acoustic hints of the AF signals. It is controlled via the B41 audio generator option. So I found it kind of interesting when I was reading that. And also in the, uh, in the block diagram, you would see the, uh, the speaker function there coming, uh, coming in. But I actually never got any sound out of that loudspeaker. 
Um, and I don't think anybody else did. I tried to look for it and I saw other, several other people asking that question via, via the internet as, as, as well. And if you look at the Roden and Swartz manual, even the, the very latest edition of it that I can find, which is for software version 5.3 or however, which is kind of the latest software firmware for this device, um, it would basically say loudspeaker for future extension. So I think the loudspeaker has always been there for the last 15, 20 years, but uh, the little piece of software code that would be required to get some sound out of the loudspeaker, I think it was never added to the device and of course now it's already way end of life so we're never going to see that anymore. So I think the loudspeaker is going to remain there unused for, for the rest of the life of all these apparently tens of thousands of CMU units that were produced by Roden and Swartz. Now if we want to do very precise measurements on things like harmonic distortions and, and noise and other things, of course we're going to need some very clean signals as well to start with. Um, and indeed it can generate that type of clean signals. And this is one of the things that's interesting about this professional level type of measurement instrument. If we look at the, um, the specifications of the device, we see for example that the, uh, that the audio signal that it is creating within the device has like a total harmonic distortion plus noise of less than 0.05% and the, the harmonic distortion alone is lower than 0.025%. So we get very, very clean type of, uh, of audio measurement signals out of, this, uh, out of this unit. Of course, these audio frequencies uh, can be selected uh, in terms of the, um, the, the, the frequency and I'll show you a little bit about the range as well. If you care really a lot about this total harmonic uh, distortion level um, and you already decided which frequency you want to use, like 1 kilohertz or 440 hertz, if, if, if you're more musical, um, then of course you could also use like a external uh, low pass filter or band pass filter after it and even creating much better cleaning signals with lower harmonic type of distortion. But I think these are already very, very clean signals to, to start with. So it has value already in, as a signal generator, a very precise one in itself. I'm going to go now into more details of the analyzer and, uh, and generator mode, huh, which is the first mode offering the basic type of, of, of measurement here. And I want to look together with you at the, the block signal to understand what the device really is, um, is doing. So let's go from the, the left to the right to get a better understanding. First of all, the device, as I explained before, generates a audio signal. Um, all the way on the left, it can be a, um, an AC or a DC signal. It can all the, go all the way from 20 Hz to 21 kilohertz. There can be a, a, a DC component um, and it goes from 0 to, to 5 volts in very small steps. Well, that goes into the, the device under, under test. And when it comes back into the device, we go through a number of different stages. First of all, we got like the AC coupling. If we wish to, uh, to activate that mode, that will ignore any DC signals. Of course, this is very similar to, uh, to an oscilloscope that invariably will have also this type of, uh, of AC-DC coupling at its uh, input state. Then we go to a bandwidth filter, and that is a fixed bandwidth uh, filter. Um, that works on the basis of a number of presets. Now, if coupling is set to AC, then we got a set of 19 different pre-programmed presets here. If the coupling is set to DC, we got 14 appropriate type of uh, filters going there. Now, then in the next stage, there is a, a weighting filter. And those type of weighting filters, these are audio weighting filters typically uh, being designed to mimic the, the, the sensitivity of the, the, the human ear. So you might know them from sound pressure level measurement and that type of stuff. So here we can select whether no filtering is happening at all. We can have A-weighted filtering. We have CCITT, huh, which is, is, is part of the ITU uh, as a standard. And we got C-message. Um, we can see CCITT, C-message, this, this is basically huh, more, more aimed at mobile telecoms equipment. These were the type of standards that were and are being used to look at audio over mobile telecoms. Huh? But we can turn the weighting off and A weighting is a more um, generic one. I actually never have been digging into it where the C message is very different from regular C type of weighting that we find much more often basically being applied huh, outside telecommunications. But, uh, but that said, that question remains to be answered. Now, the signal that we get out of that 
that is basically leading to some of the, 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 the regular type of measurements about, uh, about amplitude. So we're, we're measuring like, uh, like peak and, and RMS average type of things, and these are called measuring group one. Now, additionally, there is a variable band path filter that we can define, and there we can choose a center frequency and, and a bandwidth by itself, and that brings us to a second set of measurement frequencies that also take this additional bandwidth filter there. And then there's also a third part, and we don't find that so much in the, uh, in the block diagram in the manual, but, but, but I must assume it's there. Um, there also must be a notch filter because we can also measure total harmonic distortion plus noise type of figures. And there's also a sinet measurement in this particular part here. So I think we're going to need a, a notch filter for that. And, and actually, in the, the little information that we can find in the manual, it explains that this is notch filters automatically uh, adapted in terms of, of value. I'm not going to go in much greater details yet on, on, on Sinet because we'll focus on that in, in one of the later type of, uh, of measurements. So now knowing how the analyzer generator actually works, uh, let's do some experiments with that. Um, I prepared a little measurement setup here. Of course we got the, uh, the Roden and Swartz uh, CMU here. We'll be using the two audio ports right now, basically the audio out that is sending some things to the device on the test and the audio in with something coming back uh, back in. Um, this is actually the second channel. I'm not going to use it now. I find the naming rather confusing because we got AUX1 here and AUX2 related here to the channel 2. That, that could have been done better. Anyway, what's my device on the test here? Well, I basically be sending everything into this, uh, this small mixing desk over here that allows me to quickly set up configuration, add noise, and do a couple of other things that I'm going to tell you about later. Um, and I'm also going to look at the signals that are going, coming out of the CMU and going back into the CMU, both on the oscilloscope um, here. So this is coming out of the CMU and going into the CMU. And the signal coming into the CMU, I'm also going to send it to an audio interface right over here, connected to my computer. On my computer, I got Apple uh, Logic running. And within Apple Logic, which is their audio editing program, um, you actually have some possibilities to show a, 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 a frequency display as well. So I'll be using that to get a bit of a better understanding what actually the CMU is sending, um, sending out or so. Uh, later I'll be adding a couple of other things to the setup. Um, I've sent, set the whole system more or less to, to Unity gain, figured out a little bit the levels. I'm not going to spend too much time on that, not to make this a too lengthy uh, review. But many of the things like the output level, input levels, that can all be set and of course all has to be adjusted for the right type of, uh, of measurement. Now gets, low, gets now focus on the CMU and let's go to the audio um, menus. So we're going to go to the CMU, we're going to look at the different modules here. We go to the audio module and we got analyzer, multitone, and total harmonic distortion. So we'll start with the, um, with the analyzer mode. We get into the screen over here. And what we basically see right now is that the CMU is, um, is generating a, um, a tone. Nothing is coming back uh, right now. We can, um, we can set the frequency of the tone that it is, um, it is generating, um, obviously, here at the generator uh, level, um, we can make it 2 kilohertz, for example, and we'll actually see that happening here on the, on the um, device as well. Now, in this measurement mode, we more or less get some, some basic understanding or some, some basic measurements that we're doing on the, um, on the device. So what I'm actually going to do is going to feed a tone back into the, the, the CMU. Um, and we can see that right now on the, on the oscilloscope. We can see the tone coming in. I'm going to make it a little bit larger here. And we can now also see on the computer display that there's a tone, a single tone of one kilohertz basically going back into the uh, device, so coming out of our, out of our, our dot. Um, so we get here some basic measurements of the, the signal coming back in. We get to see something about its, its amplitude, both in terms of peak signal and, and, and uh, the average uh, root mean, mean square, RMS uh, signal. 
And we get here a second measurement as well. And the second measurement basically is a measurement after a additional bandpass filter. So I've actually set that additional bandpass filter here. Yeah, here we got it here to five kilohertz and, and, a, and a bandwidth of, uh, of one kilohertz. So it's picking out only a part of the frequency range of the total of analysis. And this explains basically why the second readings here at peak two and RMS two are smaller than, than, than peak one. We also get to see a quick view of the, the frequency that is analyzed to come back into the device. Um, and we get to see the THD plus N, which stands for the total harmonic distortion plus noise. Um, and I will be just focusing for a moment here on the on the noise uh, component here, because one thing I can do here with my mixing desk is, is add some noise and, um, and see the result of, uh, of that. When I was pl planning this measure measurement setup, I thought I'll just use an empty channel of the mixer over here, put the input gain all the way up and use that channel and I'll get a lot of noise. But actually I was very disappointed about this mixer today because it, it hardly generates any noise. It's, it's way too good really. Um, I guess mixes have gotten better over the, the years. But what I now did, I, I, I took one channel that creates a little bit of noise, then I feed that into another channel and that further amplifies. So I'm cascading two channels here to get enough noise here. So I'm getting some noise into the equation here. And look at the oscilloscope. Uh, we clearly see the noise coming up. Look at the computer screen. We see our noise coming up. And of course, look at the CMU, where we see now that the measurement for total harmonic distortion plus noise actually getting into the 30% or so. So now we're dealing with a widely distorted signal, which is obvious, of course, also from what we get to see on the oscilloscope. Um, now, so this behaves as we would, um, would expect it to behave. We also see uh, CNOT measurements here, but I'm going to leave them to, um, to another time. Um, there's a couple of more things we could say about this, uh, this particular uh, measurement function here. A little bit more advanced are the the filtering sections are the possibilities to define kind of weighting, uh, like I mentioned before in the theoretical part of this video, like uh, A weighting uh, patterns, etc. And we also have the possibility basically to analyze distortion at another frequency than the frequency set by the generator. So independently we can choose another frequency for which the measurements are being done. And I think that's also kind of useful if we would work with an external signal uh, generator here. But I will not go into further details uh, about that right now because I want to go right away to the, uh, to the second uh, measurement mode that we have uh, right here. Now the second type of measurements that I want to turn now to is the multi tone measurements. And I already introduced to you that shortly before where we have uh, a number of different tones being generated and, 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 and being analyzed to look at frequency response. Now how does the block diagram look like in, um, in this particular function? It looks like the previous one, but it is not identical. We'll see a number of, of differences. Well, first of all, the signal generator side, there's not one generator, but there are up to 20 generators at the, each, uh, at the left side. Each of them can be turned on and off individually, can be uh, set to a particular frequency, and can be set to a particular level. Uh, individual levels here are, can be set up to, 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 to almost five volts or so, but we can also set a general level for the whole uh, device, all 20 tones, and that can go up to 30 volts or so. Now, again, that goes into the device on the function. We got the uh, AC and DC coupling, and we got bandpass filters, basically, uh, which again differ in presets for the scenario of AC coupling and for the scenario of DC coupling. We again got the, uh, the weighting filter. That's something we already saw in the, in the previous part that can be turned on and off. And then we actually get to the measurement, which is here shown in, in, in a graph. We're actually getting to see the, the absolute or, or, or relative strength of these 20 tones that we're, we're looking at. And we can select basically if it's like an absolute level or relative, and then we can decide relative to which of the 20 tones. So I can basically say, I want to see the result relative to tone number eight, which might I consider my middle tone in my my system, etc. And I also can do a number of things with minimum and maximum values and warnings that I, I, I get with that. But let's now turn to the experiments where we see everything of this in practice. I'm going to go to the CMU. I'm going to here to multitone, select that, and we get to see a, another screen here, which is jumping up and down um, a bit. 
As we can already see on the oscilloscope, it's now not uh, generating a single tone, but a considerably more complex signal. And I'll actually turn on the device on the test, so it's feeding back in that, so I'm also getting to see something on my computer screen. And here we can very nicely see that it is actually creating a number of different discrete tones here. Um, on the computer screen, we have to take in, uh, into account that this is shown on, on a logarithmic uh, horizontal scale, so that's where the tones are. Here on the display, as I'll go into a little bit more detail in a second, we also always see them at an even distance, even if we choose our frequencies completely differently than, than even spacing or purely log logarithmic type of spacing. The user is entirely free to set these frequencies. Um, you can set the frequencies as such individually, um, and in that case it's, it's a good idea to, comp uh, to connect the computer keyboard uh, here. I will not go in, um, in details about all these settings, that will take too much time, so I'll just stick to the settings as we have them over now, right now. We can also define basically the, uh, the amplitude, we can do that for the whole set at once, but also for each individual tone. So all these tones are generated here uh, simultaneously at the, um, at the same time. And you already got our, our device on the test sending signals back and we basically now see that every tone is coming back at the same amplitude so we have a kind of flat frequency response here in the, um, in the device. So let's play a, a little bit with that and let's see what happens is actually we use a dot that is not a flat frequency, frequency response. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to play a little bit with the equalizer settings on my dot and I'm going to push like the high frequency up. And of course we immediately get to see here that the high frequencies are going up. This is not all basically, we're just seeing the first 14 out of 20 or so. And I can go to another menu here and we have to look where it is. I think it's right over here, tone 1 to 14. Yeah, and now we get to see 7 to 20. It's a little bit inconvenient, I would have preferred if we, saw, if we would be able to see all of them basically on the same screen here. Then we have to switch a little bit between uh, the 20 of them if we want to use them, but I'm going to leave it right here, but we saw so high frequency um, additional gain. I'm now having a lower gain, so suppressing high frequencies. Um, I can do the same thing for, for mid frequencies, frequencies up. We also see, actually we didn't see them up, we go everything going down. That's why, that's because I have set the device to look at everything uh, relative to, I think, tone 4 now in particular. But you can set actually if you look at absolute levels or something relative to one of the selected tones that you wish to compare to. And also, for example, if I turn up the bass, uh, then we get to see this. Uh, so we, we actually get to see the, uh, the frequency response very well. And of course, we see the same on the computer screen. Have we see the additional bass? I'm going to turn it back. Let me once again add high frequencies to the mix. And we also see that on the, uh, happening on the, on the computer screen. So this basically is a functionality that allows you to measure the frequency response and if they're uh, at least on, on the basis of these, uh, these 20, uh, 20 discrete uh, frequencies uh, but happening at the, at the same time. Now should you wish to test devices whether they actually need like a certain margin within that then we have a useful functionality which is actually a upper and a lower limit and that is the two red lines that you see here. So this is the lower limit line and right here we got the upper limit uh, line. Right now they're defined in, in, in steps like this, but I can make it straight lines, for example, I can define them in any way. Again, it's a good idea to connect, uh, connect the keyboard if you want to make that many edits, or even do it via the, uh, the remote interface. And also these lines now will explain you why we see here a little red bar and another red bar over here. This is basically showing that these measurements are violating the upper bar, and those measurements here are violating the lower bar and one of them is kind of turning up and down once in a while so it's just at the, the margin here, just at the, the measurement uh, value. So I hope this gives you a little bit ID for the, the multi-tone uh, functionality and again if you look at the computer screen I think we got a very nice demonstration that is actually generating all these tones at the same time.
In the third measurement mode, we're going to focus on total harmonic distortion. And again, the block diagram looks a bit similar, but is different in a number of respects from the, the previous one that we were looking at. So what's going to happen in, in this particular case? We're going to generate a signal that's going to be a, a single tone signal again. In this case, it does not have a DC offset as we saw in some of the previous scenarios. We go through the dot. We have again our AC and DC coupling. We have again our fixed bandpass filter according to a number of, of presets. And we got the, uh, the weighting filters that we've seen before as well. Now the measurement that is done out of it is basically looking at the harmonics only. So we can look at up to nine harmonics in total. That includes the first fundamental, so that eight higher harmonics have two to, to nine basically. Um, so this is what the device is, is measuring. We, we cannot choose these, these things to look at. Of course, if we look at the harmonics, we always have to go and look at discrete multiples of the tone. So if the tone is 440, then the first harmonic by definition is going to be 1880 and the second one is going to be 3 times 440, um, etc. Um, and we can look at these, these harmonic content uh, both in, 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 in percentage wise as, as, as an absolute measurement in, uh, um, in dBs. So here we go to the menu, we choose audio functions and we go to total harmonic distortions, that's it, and we start with a menu that looks like a uh, like this. We see a number of, uh, of vertical bars here and the vertical bars basically show um, a frequency with, uh, with them. And the first one is the fundamental frequency here set to uh, 1000 Hz. Um, D2 is the, uh, the first harmonic, D3 is the, uh, the second harmonic, sorry, D3 is the third harmonic all the way up to the ninth harmonic. Um, we don't get to change anything about these, uh, these values, of course, because these are simply the, 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 the harmonic, the discrete harmonics of our, our, our signal. So it doesn't make any change, sense to, to change them. However, if I would change the signal generator from 1000 to 1100, uh, then they would also scale up. We would have 2200 and 3300, um, etc. That's the way that it, uh, it works, of course. Um, we see now all the bars are already uh, there and that is basically because there's no, no signal yet uh, coming back from the dot. So we get a lot of distortion. So we get 60% uh, distortion or so. Uh, at the moment we'll be adding a signal then, um, then, then, then we'll actually see the actual measurements um, here. Now, talking about uh, distortion, of course we want some, some sources of distortion. And what sources of distortion would be better than the controversy, at least for some people, between tubes or volts and, and, and transistors, uh, with some people claiming the, the one sounds better than, uh, than the other, and both our, uh, our musician friends as, as, as well as people that are into high-end um, audio type of things. So I'm, I'm going to use that as the, um, as the test case uh, here. And if you're listening to my, my channel, I, I, I think you're probably already aware that the difference between these two different uh, devices uh, lies basically in their harmonic content. And, and, and what do our musician friends say about this? I think this is a nice summary here on, on the screen. The harmonic content of a overdriven tube amplifier consists primarily of second order and third order harmonics, with a bit of fourth order, while the harmonic content of an overdriven transistor amplifier is primarily third order with suppressed second order harmonics. And I think not only third order, but also five, seven, and nine. So all the, uh, the, the, the uneven uh, frequencies. So th that is basically what we will be expecting in our little test of, um, of today. Let me also stress one particular term used here. They're talking about overdriven. And that is also important because both tube circuits and, 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 and transistor circuits are normally designed not to have any distortion at all, to avoid it. And in their linear region, and they're normally pretty good at it. If we want to see significant distortions, we would only expect that if we go out of the linear region and we really overdrive the device in question. So that's also what I'm going to do here um, today. But normally we want to avoid it, um, but sometimes of course we want to add it because of creative effects, like, like musicians for example uh, do. But then bear in mind of course that you deliberately have to drive them precision, precisely into this uh, this, this overdrive uh, stage out of the linear uh, range. Now, what devices am I going to use today basically to create this uh, distortion? 
um, I'm going to use a, a little tube amplifier that I got over here. It's, it's not very fancy, but I think it will basically serve what we're looking for um, today, a, a, a mono tube amplifier, and I routed that via the, uh, uh, the mixer here, so I can simply on the second channel turn that one um, in. Um, and in terms of having transistor distortion, I'm, I'm just going to use the mixer itself. I'm just going to heavily overload one of the input channels. We're going to see red light. Actually, you might already see there's a red, right, red light on over, over here. And that is just as good as any other source of, of, of transistor or semiconductor distortion. Also might be an op pump. I haven't looked into the particular circuit of this, uh, this device uh, here. Um, and again, we still have in the oscilloscope and the, and the computer screen here to, uh, to be looking at. So um, let's go and look at the, um, what we get to see in the, um, yeah, in the, the, the harmonic uh, distortion part. And I'm going to add in first here a clean signal. So I'm sending back a clean signal right away from, from the dot. And what are we seeing here on the, on, on, on the CMU? We basically we see a strong fundamental frequency and then we see a number of harmonics here but all of these harmonics are fairly low i think they're all kind of below 80 maybe below 19 hertz or so and the total amount of distortion is very limited we see here 0.01 percent so he actually measuring this as a very clean signal also on our oscilloscope we see a clean sine signal coming back and also when we look at the computer screen which again is showing what is Coming back from the device on the test into the analyzer, we see a single one kilohertz, fairly clean tone. Um, I realize that this computer display does look very fancy, uh, perhaps much more attractive than something like a CMU, uh, but mind you, the CMU will be much more reliable when it comes to a measurement instrument. This is really designed to measure. When we look at the computer screen, it now says like 110 minus 120 dB, <laughs> but, but I really don't know what the dynamic range of this converter is and, and whatever. So it's, a, it's more fancy, but it's certainly not a, a measurement instrument. But it's nice, you know, as an indication of what is, uh, is going on. So it's, it's complementing our, our measurement uh, today. Now, we've seen the clean signal that is, is behaving as we believe it, um, it, 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 it should. Now I'm going to take away the clean signal and I'm going to add in the tube distorted signal. And there we go. Now we see no obvious visible distortion here at the, at the oscilloscope. I can make the signal a little bit larger. Um, but we do definitely at the CMU now see that the second harmonic came in. There's also a third and a fourth, but particularly the second harmonic uh, is still here some, if I read it well, 20 dB sec uh, stronger than the, the third harmonic. So the, the, the tube is really bringing in the second harmonic. And, and this is yeah, like we, 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 we expected, like I was reading out this text before. And also if we look at the computer display, we clearly see the second harmonic coming in at exactly 2 kilohertz and some weaker components at, at 3 and, and, and 4 kilohertz. So that is tube distortion. Let's go to the... Uh, transistor distortion, so that's coming in on this channel. And as you might already hear, this sounds oh, quite a lot a bit nastier. And we also see now the distortion levels going up quite a bit to 20% to right now. With the tube, I don't think I mentioned it, but it, it went somewhere to 1% of uh, harmonic distortion. Now we're all the way up to 20% harmonic distortion uh, with this particular um, yeah, setting of my, my, my mixer overload. And what we clearly see, now it's the uneven harmonic. Three, five, seven, and nine that are dominating. And those uneven harmonics, that is really what creates a relatively aggressive type of, of, of distortion that, 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 that you'll probably be, uh, be accustomed to, to. And that's often used as a creative effect in, in, in like a rock and, and metal music as, uh, as well. Um, yeah, so everything behaves really like expected and we can use the CMU very well to basically show us the harmonic content of a, um, of a signal. Now one last thing I wanted to say about this particular measurement and that is about the, the way that total harmonic distortion is being expressed here. Because like I explained before, uh, on other screens we see 
THD plus N, plus NOI, and this is only THD. So what, what I really want to stress here, and I'm going to bring back my, my original signal again, my, my, my clean type of signal, what I would like to stress here is that in this distortion management, it's only looking at the harmonic components compared to the fundamental signal. And it will try to ignore any type of other signal like noise in between. And there lies the difference between THD plus N, that we saw a little while ago, and THD here. So this should be kind of immune to noise. That's the way that's defined. And let's also see if we can check that in a measurement. So now I'm going to add noise to our measurement. I'm already hearing a considerable amount of noise. I hope you can also hear that in the YouTube video. But nevertheless, we see the distortion figure is still hovering about 1%. It's not at all at the 50% or so that we had before when we had clearly notable noise, but only 1%. Why did it have a bit of effect eh, from, from, from about 0 to about 1? That is because of the noise component that have to be exactly at those frequencies where the harmonic content is. Because this is measured by a given resolution bandwidth around the harmonic component and that is picking up some noise. So if I turn the noise off and on, and we do see the individual components going up and down a little bit because there is some noise also at those frequencies. And again, we are on a logarithmic scale, so we see the effect quite pronounced, but it's still very small compared to the, uh, to the fundamental uh, frequency. So this is a type of measurement that is discarding all the noise and only focusing on the harmonic uh, dimension of, uh, of added noise. Now, the, the RF receiver measurement mode that I want to go into more detail today is the, uh, the SINET uh, testing. Um, and I would like to do a little bit of an introduction of what SINET is so we know that we're, we're, we're talking about. SINET is a common way to measure the sensitivity of a radio receiver. It can be a range of different receivers, it basically can be AM or FM, can be even digital receivers. We'll just now focus on analog uh, FM receivers in, in, in the examples that we're going to look at here. And basically what Synet is trying to, to do is try to see how much input to the receiver, a very small signal, is required for an intelligible audio output. Not a perfect output, but intelligible output. And Trying to determine that value, the SINET measurement looks at three different components. The wanted signal, the noise, and the distortion. Because both noise and distortion may come into the picture when we talk about uh, signals that are not being as good as you, you want them to be. And SINET then is being defined as 10 types of logarithmic of all the signals together. So that is the power of the wanted signal, the power of the noise, and the power of the harmonic distortions. Uh, over the power of the noise and the, the power of the distortion. And that basically, yeah, you can think of it kind of as, as, as a signal noise ratio, but taking into account both noise and harmonic uh, types of distortions. Um, when is something intelligible? Well, the common standard value to look at for SINET is, is 12 dB. That's how, how this is all done. This is a value where you can kind of just hear these sounds. You're going to hear significant noise and another type of, of things on the, on the line, but you can still kind of understand what's being said on the other uh, side of the line, if we're talking about speech type of thing. Um, as we will see later, we can basically set other values, target values for, for, for SINET, but the 12 dB value is kind of the, the, the international accepted value at which you do SINET type of measurements. To understand more how SINET is being, uh, being measured, um, I'm basically taking this sheet now for, from a, a presentation of Roden and Swart, which is available on, on, on YouTube. I think it's a very good presentation, so if you're interested, in dig into that. Um, but what it basically explains, uh, the, the setup that we see is very similar to the setup that we got right here on the, on the table today. Uh, we got a generator with a, um, with, with a tone that we use for testing things. We go via a receiver, and what we get back basically is the tone, including the type of distortions that we might not want, eh? so noise distortion, as you see it, and harmonic distortion. And then what the measurement system is going to do is use like a very narrow type of notch filter, taking out the desired tone and only leaving the undesired components, both harmonic 
and noise. And once we have done that, we can compare it with the total signal. Actually, we got back the formula that I've just been talking about. And that way we can determine what, what sign that is. Now here we see the block diagram, how this is being implemented in the, um, in the Roden and Swartz device. Uh, again, this block diagram is slightly different from the ones that we've seen before. We start by generating an, an, an audio tone. Um, then basically we got a, uh, a mixer um, transmitter, if you, you wish, basically, had to create a, um, a modulated tone. And interestingly, then that can go all the way, this carrier from 30 kilohertz to, to 2.7 gigahertz. So kind of all over the, the bandwidth of the, uh, the RF bandwidth of the device, we can, uh, can do that. We will later see that you have to set these values in a raster. They go by steps of 30 kilohertz. And that has something to do with the original AMS telecom standard that, that this was designed to, to test. But fortunately, we got some, uh, some offset values that allow us to, to go anywhere. So we're not going to be really limited there. Uh, we can set things like the, the, the frequency deviation level and a number of other parameters. I'm not going to go in, in each detail. We got here a bandpass filter with 18 presets that we can choose from. We got whiting filters. We've seen that before, I'm not going to talk about that more right now. And then we're going to go to our audio measurement. And so the signal coming back basically can be measured in terms of its, its amplitude, uh, the hum and noise, which can be basically measured by turning the, uh, the signal on and off. And then we also see our notch filter. And that is the notch filter that we just saw in the previous sheet on the block diagram of, uh, of the YouTube video of Roden and Swartz taking out the fundamental signal that we're interested in and thus allowing us basically to pick out exactly, uh, to isolate the noise and the harmonic distortions and then compare that to the, uh, to the total type of signal. So we see very nice here basically the, uh, yeah, the type of, uh, of, of, of measurement functionality that is required to do something like, like sign that type of, uh, of measurements here. Okay, let's now go to some hands-on Sinet uh, testing of uh, receiver sensitivity. And what is my measurement setup here? I got a Sennheiser receiver. It's a uh, FM uh, receiver. And this is a receiver basically for a wireless microphone or for a belt pack um, transmitter. This is what I use on a weekly basis if I make uh, music myself. Um, and I thought I wanted to test um, the, uh, the sensitivity of this particular receiver here. So how it's set up basically, well, the CMU, of course, over here, um, which is going to send out a RF frequency via the RF1 output here. We already see the indication light here. And then basically something is received and sent back via the audio outputs and goes into the AF1 in AF input here on the, uh, on the CMU. Um, the same audio signal I'm also sending to uh, headphones I got over here so I can hear what I'm doing as well as to, the, uh, to one of the cameras that is, uh, that is recording. Um, this is a true diversity receiver, so you can see it written on it. It got two antennas signified here or indicated by the one and the two uh, here in the antenna part, so it will automatically switch between two antennas. Uh, but it will automatically take the strongest antenna signal, so it will automatically pick the only wire that I have attached to it. Now let's first go to the, to the right application on the device. So I do menu select, I'm going to the AMPS mobile station. So this is a functionality for analog mobile phones, the, the, the US AMPS uh, standard, however we can also use it um, to test other types of devices, but we'll need to take into account several things that are particularly set or, or chosen for mobile phones. So I go there, ah, I go a little bit too fast, I go to the, uh, the non-signaling uh, part, what I'm going to be needing here, and opening that part. Here are a couple of tests, and one of them I think is RX test, and within RX test we got AF analyzer, hum and noise, and sensitivity. Now, I will start here going to the AF analyzer so I can do the various settings here. Here I am, and I'll do an overall reset of the device right now, so we go to the default settings, if you ever would do the same thing. So you see the steps that have to be taken here. Now, a couple of things we have to, to, to set here, and most obviously we'll have to set the right frequency at which this receiver is tuned into. 
um, and I can do that to go to the RF generator and I get to see here some, some, some parameters including the, the, the frequency um, and the frequency of my device is 638.550 so now I'll type here 638.5 and I won't do 550 but I'll do 551 and I'll tell you in a second why because I'm getting an error and the error tells me basically that I'm not doing this in the predefined increments. So what is this predefined increments? Well, again, this was made for mobile phones according to the M standards, this particular application. And these M standards had, particular, had a particular raster of 30 kilohertz. So the, the channels were 30 kilohertz apart. And that's the way frequencies are selected here. So you can only select frequencies within a, fifth, uh, a 30 kilohertz raster. Now, luckily enough, my device happens to be exactly at an existing raster frequency. Now, it's, it's not lucky enough I actually search for this particular frequency because there's a limited number of frequencies this can work on and there's a raster over here and I tried to figure out until I got to a combination that worked for both. Uh, but it might take you a bit of work to, um, to figure that out. You do have a little bit of a freedom here with frequency offset where you can actually program a frequency offset of plus or minus 15 kilohertz so that allows you already to move quite a little bit um, uh, around actually 30 kilohertz minus and plus it, it, it's almost like the 30 kilohertz so I think it it kind of gets you everywhere but I haven't played around with that too much uh, yet I, I just was able to find a frequency that I could use without having to use the frequency offset possibility here so now I've set it to the right channel um, it's a bit unfortunate that for the analyzer basically you're allowed to switch between discrete and continuous frequency and then you can select kind of any frequency but that's the analyzer part and we're not at the analyzer part we're at the generator part here for the particular test that we are, are doing here so uh, so too bad anyway we got it here I can already kind of turn my uh, my device on here at the um, at this given um, frequency ah, we got a cat joining us in today hi you coming and see the measurements? Yeah. Maybe you'll rather want to go down for a sec. Huh? There you go. Okay, so that's, that's step one that we, uh, we got to take. Step number two that we got to take is that we want to take care of some of the specific transmitter uh, or, or, or the, the, the protocol uh, specifics. And one particular one that we need to look at here is the... Um, and I need to be there to generate, so for that, uh, the modulator uh, settings. And here we find the frequency deviation of the FM uh, transmitter, which is set to 8 kHz as a standard, because that was for AMPS uh, phones. Now, I looked up in the specification of, um, of the Sennheiser receiver, and basically there I found it has a frequency deviation of 25 kHz nominal, and I think a little bit more uh, peak. So should be setting this at 25 kilohertz, 25K. Strange enough, the K button doesn't always work on the CMU. I don't know when it works or not, but if I do 25, um, if, if I just clear the, the value, and I do 25,000, enter, I do get to the value. Although it's warning me it's out of range. You can only do 20K instead of 25K. That's a bit unfortunate, but we'll have to live with it. So that's the setting that I'm going to choose right now. Now, so after we, 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 we've set that part, I think we set most of the, um, the relevant part here. Uh, we can put the audio tone on, it's at uh, 1004 hertz, I'm fine with that. We can turn this on, we can turn this part on. And basically the system is running now, but we don't get anything yet. Now let's increase the... Um, the power here and let's see if we get some signal coming in we're not getting anything yet I'm starting to see something here I don't hear a tone yet and now I get it here but what's happening here that below a certain level I actually see mute and this is going to be a problem in this particular test because I want to find out the lowest sensitivity of this receiver but way before we get to the lowest sensitivity, it already turns on mute. Why is this happening? 
Well, again, I told you this is for on-stage type of, of, of use here, and they really want to prevent that in a big venue, you're going to get something like white noise on the loudspeakers. So it has several mechanisms by which it mutes, squelches the, the receiver. One of them is actually with a pilot tone, which is not like a sub-audio pilot tone that you find in many CB systems, but it's actually, I think, a higher than audible frequencies type of pilot tone. I already disabled that part, but we also got a, a mute that is basically on a squelch threshold level. Now there is some possibility in the device to go there. If you go to the menu, actually I'm, I'm, I'm right there in the, the menu. I choose for that and we can choose between high, middle and low. But that's not, uh, not good enough. So I spent quite a lot of time trying to figure it out until I got to a service node that for service application there's an additional hidden mode here. I have to set it on low, choose it. I have to go again to the setting while it is on low and press 5 or 10 times on this, seconds on this button. And then I can get to off mode and I set it again. Now we got rid of any squelch in this device and now we can kind of freely play around and reduce the power. So that's actually what I'm going to do right now. You see me here reducing the power. You see the power going down here in a moment on that device. Turning the button. Turning the button. Signals should get worse and I see audible noise coming in. Further going down, more and more noise. And further go down, even more noise. And I actually see the value here for CNAT going red. When it's going red, it's going red actually on the target value of uh, 12 dB. That can be set to other values, but 12 dB is a very common value to use for this type of application. So I can manually already determine by playing a little bit around with my button that at a little bit higher, a little bit lower, a little bit lower, at about 45 dBm, minus 45 dBm of, 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 of transmit power, my device gets below its sensitivity level that you still have an audible signal uh, with a value of 12 for, for, for Sina. Now this is the, um, the manual type of test we can do and of course if we increase the power then we get like a very good signal and, and Sina is going somewhere towards 60 dBs or so. I don't want to push it too high, I don't know when I'm going to damage this uh, receiver. Um, there's also a, a automatic function to find the Sina, now we know everything is, uh, is running. So within AF Analyzer, we go application and we go to sensitivity. It's already running now. It's automatically kind of playing with the values. And again, we got somebody walking in the picture. It found the value at which it comes to sign at 12 and it stopped the application with the uh, hold uh, function here. So basically it determined now for me that at minus 44.9 dBm, that is the value at which sign at becomes lower than 12 and, and, and the system stopped. I can kind of run it again, if I do sensitivity here, off, run the function again, it will again run this algorithm. It goes actually from high to low, not from low to high. I read about some other systems that go from low to high when they start to reach 12, this one seems to go from a higher value and go down until it, uh, it reaches 12. Um, this value of 12 for this particular application, you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense because you don't want a wireless microphone system with this amount of noise. But anyway, this is the standard by which the sensitivity of, of receivers is, is, is measured. So I'll go with that uh, value. Although personally, I will be more interested for this particular device. And now I'll go back to the RF generator level. When I get something that, that is of a much higher level basically than, than, than sign at 12. So, so probably personally I will not be very happy if, if Sinet is less than, than, than 30 or so for the particular functionality. And that's also where the squelch filter for this device are being set at. Um, but, but, but having this discussed this, uh, we see it's working perfectly well as a, uh, as a device for, for Sinet testing. Um, the downside is a bit of the, 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 the grid. Uh, although I think you can get around with it with the frequency offset possibility, but you, you have to pay some attention to the grid. Some limitation when it comes to the FM deviation frequency. Um, that's all a little bit, of course, still with in mind that this was designed for, for, for amps. Then again, I have to say, 
it accepts any frequency range and not only the very limited frequency ranges that were uh, assigned to, to M's operation, etc. So in the end, it's still much more flexible than it, it might have been if they would have chosen for a very strict implementation here. So I, 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 I must compliment Roden and Swartz actually for making the device as flexible as it is because it's not obvious, I think, if you make something for M's testing that it can actually go to any type of, uh, of frequency band and not only limited to the specific frequency band for M. So, um, so, so far the, uh, the Sinet testing, everything working well. So, time to conclude. I'll make a, a couple of observations and ask myself a couple of questions. The, um, the first observation is the, uh, the CMU200 is quite a powerful audio tester. I think there are a lot of interesting things you can do with it and it's got magnificent hardware um, Anyway, it's also fun to work with devices that once upon a time were probably the, the best that, that existed uh, in, this, uh, in this world. Um, also the observation that, that the design of the whole device and the parameters that are chosen, etc., are basically for mobile terminal testing. You always have to keep that in mind. Uh, but, but they can be worked around, I think, to a very significant degree. Uh, the device offers audio testing all the way up to 20 kilohertz. We, we, we have the right filters to do that. It does offer the full uh, radio frequency uh, bandwidth range all the way to 2.7 gigahertz, so not limited to any specific radio or communication interface, etc. Um, the fact that you set radio frequency in a 30 kilohertz raster, as I talked about, can be worked around. Sometimes a little bit of an annoyance, uh, but, um, but it's all possible. Could it be improved? Yes, of course, there are always things to improve. And if you would ask me, I would say harmonize all the audio functionality across, mo across modes. Particularly the AMPS mode and the standalone mode and, 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 um, are, are very different in the way that, that, that things are named and, and positioned in the device. I would also really like it if something like hum and noise measurement were also available for standalone uh, AF type of testing. Thinking about it, I would also really love it if there would be a single screen in which we get total harmonic distortion plus noise, total harmonic distortion only, noise only, and compare that to the signal, we get everything nicely together. Now we have to go across all different menus, etc., to get these things uh, together. Another thing that I would like, if we can see all the 20 test tones at once, instead of seeing one to 14 and have to move around to see other tones. Yeah, all kind of small things, etc., that, that could be improved, but but altogether, I think it's a, it's a satisfying instrument for this type of, uh, of applications. Is it worth the investment here as a uh, audio analyzer, as a generic device? Yeah, that, that depends a bit, I would say. Honestly, at normal prices for a second-hand unit, I don't think I would be looking for, for a unit like this one if it were just only for audio um, analysis. There are probably more specialized units around, depending on your... Uh, your, your, your profile, your, your exact needs and, and, and testing profile, etc. Um, if you already have a Roden and Swartz and there should not be the, the, the B41 module in it, it's a bit of the same story because as, as, as far as I could see, looking around a little bit on the internet, the separate B41 modules are sold for, for very high prices, uh, upwards of $1,000 uh, or so. Um, I don't think I would pay that much just for only the... Uh, the, the, the B41 unit. Then again, if you already happen to have the CMU um, or you're, you're thinking about buying it also because of its other capabilities as a spectrum analyzer, as a, uh, as a power meter, as a, a signal generator and, and all the other stuff I'll be talking about, um, yeah, then, then definitely um, be, be inspired and, and use it for all these things. Look at my, my videos, you, you might pick up some interesting thing for there. And, and yeah, definitely go ahead and use it as an audio tester. I think it's a very capable uh, device. So if you look at this overall range of things, I think the, uh, the CMU uh, is worth as money as a generic device if you're interested in really a, a couple of different type of functionalities here. Um, if you would only be buying it for, for the audio functionality, probably better choices around, but, um, but I do like it. As you can see from, from the video, um, if you have one and it has the unit in there, definitely go ahead. That's it for today and hope to see you soon and there will be one or more episodes as well about the CMU, about remaining functionality that I haven't covered yet in my videos. Thank you.